Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started in just a moment. Just letting everyone join the room. Well, while we have people still joining the room, I'm going to go ahead and get started with our uh, introduction for this evening. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I am happy to introduce tonight's speaker, Gary Rivlin, who will be talking about his newest book, I have it right here, Saving Main Street, Small Business in the Time of COVID-19. Now, this week is Global Entrepreneurship Week. The library has had several programs to highlight entrepreneurship. And Global Entrepreneurship Week is actually part of a larger celebration of all things entrepreneurship during the month of November. We are so happy to have Gary speak this evening as his book, in my opinion, as I've read it, really captures both the struggles of operating a small business, as well as the determination and passion at the heart of small business owners. And I'm sure Gary will speak to that tonight. Now, copies of Saving Main Street are available for purchase, courtesy of Hudson's own independent bookstore, The Learned Owl. We will add a link to the chat for easy purchase. After Gary is done speaking this evening, we will have time for some audience questions. Please feel free to submit any questions you may have using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Now, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker. Gary Rivlin is a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter and the author of nine books, including Katrina, After the Flood. His work has appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, Newsweek, Fortune, GQ, Wired, and others. He's also a two-time Gerald Loeb Award winner. So Gary, I'd like to say thank you, and uh, just thank you so much for joining us. Would you like to talk a little bit about your book? I would. Thank you so much, Kelsey. I appreciate that kind introduction, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. So it was the spring of 2020, and like everyone else, I was cooped up at home. Um, my particular dungeon was a New York City apartment, I have two elementary school kids, so I had that burden as well. I was the writing teacher uh, for a couple of weeks, and even once they went back to school, you know, I was the hall monitor, the lunch lady, the IT guy, and the, the gym teacher. And, you know, like a lot of people, I started thinking about worrying about small businesses in my life. Uh, you know, Claude, my local pharmacist, uh, Marcos, who cuts my hair and co-owns the shop where I, I go, uh, a favorite uh, date night restaurant my wife and I like a few blocks from where we, where we live, the nice couple behind the kid's toy store uh, near, our, near our place. And, you know, I, I was, I was worried, right? I mean, we we're hearing about everyone is buying online. We were buying so much online. And that's when I started thinking, huh, I, I really, I really want to delve in uh, to this. Amazon was clearly going to survive, but would the small businesses survive? Adding to my interests, my dad was a small business operator his whole adult life. And so I'd seen up close that small business is hard. Running a small business is hard, even in normal times. How would they survive? How would they survive this? So I, I focused on Northeastern Pennsylvania, plenty of small businesses here in New York City, um, but I really wanted to choose some place away, away from the coast. And there's something really compelling about uh, the Scranton area and North, Northeastern Pennsylvania. For starters, I could drive there and early in the pandemic, that was obviously a big uh, concern, but there was a diversity. You know, there's Scranton and a few other cities in the area, there's these towns and a, a large rural area that the locals call the Endless Mountains. Uh, this used to be a coal region up until like the 1970s. So it's also a place that's struggled. They were really starting to turn things around, Scranton, et cetera. Uh, we're really kind of bringing businesses back, but now uh, COVID hit. And so I'll confess now that when I started, I feared that I'd be chron chronicling this great, uh, economic carnage. Uh, remember back, the predictions were that 25% of small businesses were going to go under, 33% of small businesses were going to go under, 40% of independent uh, restaurants. And I, I remember talking to my editor uh, and saying, you know, I was worried that I'd be writing a really, really depressing book. Um, but, you know, what I found on the road was far more interesting and far more inspiring. And that's really what I want to focus on 
uh, tonight. And maybe I want to provide some uh, good news uh, in what seemed very bleak times. There really was no great small business die-off. There were sad stories. There were losses. Uh, we've all lost, no doubt, favorite uh, shops, favorite restaurants, but it wasn't the calamity that prognosticators uh, were predicting. So what I did is followed an a ensemble cast, a small crew of small business owners, a restaurant owner, a hair salon owner, uh, a, a retail store in the, in the um, rural area. And you know, I just, I just wanted to follow them. They were hit by this huge blow. We all were, but you know, a small business, you know, they were uh, ordered to lock down by the governor, uh, a restaurant could do takeout only, you know, how are they going to, how they absorb that first blow? How are they going to uh, survive this? Uh, so one of the main businesses is Cusimano's. It's an Italian restaurant in a very unique, fun town called Old Forge, Pennsylvania. It's right outside of, of Scranton. Uh, TJ Cusimano, the chef owner and his wife, Nina, um, opened this restaurant at the end of 2013. First years were a real struggle. Uh, owning a restaurant is never easy. And they didn't take salaries for a couple of years off and on. Um, but by COVID, they were finally, you know, hitting, hitting, hitting their stride. Things were going uh, really well. But, you know, when you think about those 40% of independent restaurants going under, that could have been them. They had, you know, maybe two or three weeks worth of savings in the bank. And they're a high-end Italian restaurant. It wasn't pizza and pasta. It didn't really lend itself uh, to takeout and delivery like other uh, restaurants. But, you know, this gets to the First thing I want to underscore how critical creativity was to the resiliency uh, of these businesses. I, I used to write about Silicon Valley, I used to cover Silicon Valley in the 1990s and 2000s. And they always talked about entrepreneurship and you know how these entrepreneurs could pivot. They were nimble on their feet. TJ Cusimano, the, the, the entrepreneurs I wrote about in Silicon Valley have nothing on TJ Cusimano. So COVID hits, um, uh, the governor closes them down, closes down all restaurants in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, most governors around the country did this, to indoor dining. And so what are they going to do? First thing they do, they say, huh, we have all this produce, we have all these perishables, the town needs to eat, suddenly everyone is having to cook their meals three times a day uh, for, them, for themselves. So they bagged up vegetables, they bagged up flour, they put uh, sauces in containers, uh, and opened an uh, open air market uh, on the back porch uh, of the restaurant uh, that helped feed the town and also bring in brought in money at a time they really needed uh, cash. And from then he just kind of tried anything. You know, one that didn't work were the meal kits, you know, like Blue, Blue Apron. Um, he felt like, okay, I'll kind of portion the ingredients, give instructions, and let people cook some dishes at, at home. That proved a total bust. People who pay restaurant prices do not want to cook it and then maybe more importantly, clean up uh, afterwards. But, you know, he did Taco Tuesdays. Uh, again, high-end Italian restaurant, Taco Tuesdays. That proved a big hit, especially because the governor of the state um, was allowing them to uh, sell alcohol uh, to go. Uh, so they were selling margaritas. Uh, he never really particularly cared for barbecue. Uh, but he watched YouTube videos on how to uh, learn how to barbecue, um, Southern style barbecue, found a smoker used online. And by May, uh, every weekend, uh, he was doing barbecue. He made thousands and thousands of dollars every weekend on barbecue chicken, barbecue ribs, all the, all the sides. Uh, there was a long time when they could, you know, once, once they reopened, it was three months where about three months uh, that indoor dining was closed. Once they reopened, uh, it was at 25% capacity. He didn't even think it was worth it at 25% capacity. So he kept it just kind of outdoor dining. He got a tent, uh, kept it on his back, back porch. Uh, and through that time, he just tried anything. The governor shut them down again. Remember the fall of 2020, there was a big surge. Uh, the governor of Pennsylvania shut down indoor dining for several weeks in, um, in, in Pennsylvania. And so he started, he pivoted to uh, special meals for Thanksgiving, for Christmas Eve, for Christmas Day, for New Year's Eve, for New Year's Day, made tens of thousands of dollars uh, in this kind of new sort of business and did what he needed to do, which was keep the business, keep the business open. Today, I was just there a few weeks ago, 
uh, the business is thriving, he survived, which was kind of every small business owner's job or goal through COVID. I just want to live long enough that I could go back to the typical struggle of running a small business rather than you know the, the COVID struggles. And of course, it wasn't just DJ. I, 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 while working on this project, I was reading about small businesses around the country and their creativity. The one small business in, uh, in my book uh, and that isn't in North, northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, is in the Bronx. There are three black siblings behind Sol Cacao. It's a, a chocolate maker. They make fine chocolates. Uh, you know, they had been struggling uh, for four or five years when COVID hit. Most of their sales were either at uh, uh, farmers markets or festivals. They're in a few specialty shops, but mainly they did sales by doing Saturday and Sunday tastings. You know, taste a little bit of the chocolate. I like this. I'll 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 buy a bar. That was completely shut down uh, by COVID. The specialty shops where they were selling tended to be closed down too, and they were having no income come, no income come in. Uh, they pivoted. They were creative. They did what they had to do. Uh, corporations were looking for ways to thank employees for uh, their dedicated service through COVID. Uh, they were looking for kind of bonding exercises to so the chocolate tastings. You know, within a year of COVID, it went from 90% of their sales uh, through retail to 90% of their sales, well, 50% online uh, through just individuals and most of the rest through corporations. They survived. And by the way, today, uh, retail has reopened, of course. They're doing very well on the retail front. And meanwhile, they have these extra revenue streams, people buying directly from their website and, and corporate sales. So the, 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 the second factor that helped explain how small businesses were able to defy the odds, defy the predictions, is just pure grit. Uh, I talk about um, a gay couple in Scranton, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, 10 years ago, a dozen years ago, they put everything into purchasing a pair of historic sites, Scranton in the day, in the cold days. It was quite, quite the grand uh, city, uh, fallen on hard times. They bought these two properties, refurbished them, and turned them into wedding venues. They were doing really well. Both were members of the Chamber of Commerce. They were leaders in the community. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were succeeding. Then COVID hit, wiped out their business entirely. No one was doing weddings. They did you know, corporate events, uh, smaller parties, 50th birthday parties, those kind of things. Virtually no, no business at all. But they showed the fortitude. They showed the grit. Uh, one of them donned a red vest uh, five times a week and worked at a, as a clerk at a Lowe's. Uh, the other went to work as a, a picker for a small grocery chain. Uh, online orders would come in and he would fill the orders. And, you know, they just did what they had to do today. Uh, now they can't keep up with all the weddings and other events that people want to have. They're booked every Saturday, they're booked every Sunday, and sometimes Wednesday, Thursdays, uh, and Fridays, too. Uh, in Tekanic, this is a small town of around 1,800 people in a, a sparsely populated uh, county. This woman, Glenda Shoemaker. Uh, Glenda's mom in the 1970s with a partner opened J&R's Hallmark, uh, sold cards, greeting cards, and, and gifts. For a time, it was just a great, great uh, business. But by the time Glenda got into the business uh, in the 2000s, Things had gotten hard, even before COVID. She was going against every trend. Uh, people are, people are uh, less likely to buy greeting cards. She's selling gifts, but you know, so does the Walmart on the edge of her town. In fact, there was this Yankee candle that she used to sell. It's a very popular seller uh, for her, great item for her uh, every Christmas. She goes to the new Walmart what, shortly after it opened up, and she saw that the same exact price she was paying uh, to a wholesaler is the price that the Walmart was selling it for. She couldn't carry the candle anymore. So she was kind of up against it even before uh, COVID hit. Her mother had retired. It was just her. And she did it. Just every day would go to work seven days a week. And just she showed the fortitude. It was it was her her dream, her mother's dream, and didn't want to you know be the one who saw uh, her mother's still living, didn't want to have to explain to her mother, like, sorry, the store went under. And as she told me, it was pretty profound that, like, if I'm not Glenda Shoemaker of JR's Hallmark, who am I? 
And that's the thing about small businesses. It's the creation of that entrepreneur. It's, it's their everything. It's their identity. And across the board, every single entrepreneur, every small business operator uh, I engage with uh, just did whatever they could uh, to stay open. You know, there's the, there's the cliche, it takes a village. In the case of small businesses, staying open, it was true. The chambers, the local chambers of commerce in every area, they were key. Uh, the, the, the small business development centers, they offer consultants free to small businesses as a way of evening up the playing field uh, for, for small uh, businesses. The trade associations, they gave, all of them gave information uh, to the entrepreneurs early on to let them know what's going on, letting them know of different places uh, where there was funding available, there might be might be help, gave them tips. They would run webinars, you know, offering tips on marketing, on how to deal with, you know, kind of keeping the your retail uh, retail establishment uh, safe for people coming, coming, coming in. And they really, I think, were among the unsung heroes of COVID, the Chamber of Commerce presidents, et cetera. In fact, this Saturday is uh, uh, a special small business, support small business day. All the local chambers in Northeastern Pennsylvania I dealt with had these same kind of things, different you know, events and different you know, efforts to try to get people to buy local. To you, you don't want those stores to leave. If the store leaves, that restaurant, if the restaurants leave, if Main Street becomes an empty street, what do you have? Everyone's going to the big box stores, they're eating at, at restaurants at the edge of the highway, or they're sitting at home going on online. Um, and the last, you don't really hear this very often, but government worked. I could write a dissertation about everything that was wrong with the Paycheck Protection Program. That was the program the government created, the Congress created in the spring of 2020 uh, to, set, to help small businesses. Here's a program expressly created for small businesses and they gave funding to businesses up to 500 employees making tens of millions in revenue booking tens of million in revenue uh, every year that's not a small business by my criteria it's not a small business by most people's criteria i mean to me the small businesses i focused on were 5 10 15 maybe 25 employees but certainly not 3 4 5 500 and then of course there was this exemption this uh, uh loophole that was uh, tossed into PPP right before it passed by the US uh, Senate um, saying that any place with 500 employees per physical location. And that's how we saw all these publicly traded companies, all these giants uh, with thousands and thousands of employees getting PPP money because they might have 10,000 employees across the country, across the, across the globe, but they only had 50 at this establishment or hundred at that. So they were able to get money that was expressly set aside for small business. All of that said, it was inefficient, there's corruption. All of that said, PPP amounted to about $800 billion. There's a second program for small business that uh, set aside another 200 billion or so. And you throw a trillion dollars at a problem, it's amazing what you can, amazing what you could do. Several of the small businesses I was following said, we would not have survived uh, if it wasn't for uh, for PP for PPP, um, and so again, I thought like, oh, okay, twenty five percent, one out of four businesses I'm following would go under. The dozen I followed closely, none of them uh, went out of business. I followed or I contacted around 60, 60 plus small businesses. Only one was a casualty of COVID, and honestly, I contacted them once I read about them in the newspaper that they were about to close, just because I wanted to capture that. Uh, experience. The Fed did a study um, that showed that in a typical year, about eight and a half percent of small businesses uh, go under. In 2020, as best they could tell, 11, 11 and a half percent went under. A lot of sadness, a lot of loss, but nowhere near uh, the economic catastrophe that people were, were predicting. Uh, another study from out of uh, UC Santa Cruz, University of California at Santa Cruz, showed that there are actually more small businesses today than there were uh, at the end of 2019. Some of that is because people lost their job and you know, by default they became small business people. But you know, the great resignation, stimulus dollars, kind of a, a, this moment in people's lives uh, with COVID that they 
to look at what are the true values. A lot of businesses were started, those that went out of business, there were empty storefronts. There's so the, the entrepreneurship actually went up uh, in 2021 and it's still going up uh, uh, this year. So I wanna leave time for questions, but I would like to read one small piece. Um, it's about TJ Cusimano, he's the, the restaurant uh, owner. I just wanna give you a flavor of TJ's uh, character. Um, let's say that Cusimano's is not a place where the customer is always right. Um, in this case, I'm quoting Bob Mulcarin. He was the former mayor of Old Forge, that's the town where, where Cusimano's is. And he started bartending as soon as he was done, when he was done with his, his term, he, he served for a single term. This is from a chapter called, People Hate Us on Yelp. Oh, Bob Mulcarin, the former mayor, had just started as a part-time bartender at in 2017. He knew TJ as a pretty mellow guy, but then he caught a glimpse of TJ reacting to a customer who had insulted his cooking. A customer, a waitress told him, had just described his ravioli as the worst she had ever tasted in her entire life, so bad that she wanted the order struck from her bill. Mulcarin watched from behind the bar as TJ made a beeline for the table. TJ makes his ravioli from scratch. Mulcarin is among those who think it's the best he's ever eaten. I'm quoting Mulcarin. He asked her, like of all the raviolis you've ever had over your entire life, the worst you've ever had in that all that time is right here on your plate? The woman just stared at TJ wide-eyed wide and mute as he kept talking. I'm quoting. Because I spent a part of my afternoon downstairs making them and I must be doing something really, really wrong. What struck Mulcarin was TJ seemed almost to be enjoying himself. So I can tell you about more businesses. They're really, I, I, I really, I, I've always respected small businesses. Again, I saw up close as a child, you know, how hard my father worked, how hard a road uh, it was. It was ups and downs, there's recessions, there's bad luck, there's a competitor opens across uh, the street. He, he, for a long time was in the pet shop uh, business and some big chain came and, and that really, you know, hit them uh, hard. I, I just really marveled at how amazing uh, they were, but I do want to leave time for, for questions. So Kelsey, why don't you take it away? Thank you so much for that overview of your book. Um, I personally read the book. It was a fantastic read. Um, I like how you wrote it, that it was written more like a novel. You kind of just fall in with these characters, but knowing, you know, even if you haven't been to Pennsylvania, I'm sure everyone in this audience tonight, um, has their own memories, especially of the early pandemic and how everything was. Um, so we are having a few questions coming in. Please feel free to add, add. I actually have some questions myself that I think maybe everyone would like to know. Um, I kind of like how you chose Pennsylvania because it's different than New York and it was drivable. I'm just curious what um, attributes, like how did you find the specific people you interviewed um, and how receptive were they to like being in your book? Right, so um, my, my spouse is in the theater, so I call them auditions. So, you know, early on, I was meeting people this way via Zoom. Uh, you know, there was a kind of a lockdown. The governor of Pennsylvania did not want me coming to his state um, as someone from New York, especially then. And so I would just, I, I would talk to people. I, I, I did have some criteria in my head, which some of which I broke once I met people. You know, I, I wanted people who were survivors. There's an amazing stat, um, amazing statistic that 50% of small businesses will fail within five years. And so I wanted to find survivors. So criteria number one is I wanted a business to be around at least five years. Um, and I wanted diversity. I wanted diversity in every sense of that word, type of business, rural versus urban, male, female, uh, people of color. Uh, I, I just, I, I really thought that was an age. I wanted different uh, ages. TJ Cusimano, Nina Cusimano, they're in their thirties. Um, and, you know, there's a, a pharmacist, you know, rural pharmacist, you know, he's in his 60s. And I, I just really kind of want to show diversity. And again, one thing I liked about Pennsylvania was kind of the rural urban. A last thing, by the way, and this was just personal interest. I kind of knew, I think a lot of people knew in the spring of 2020 that Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania was going to be the center of the political universe. And I thought that would be fun. I think Joe Biden came to North Pennsylvania, Northern, Northeastern Pennsylvania six or seven times this is in the book. I just can't remember. Trump came six or seven times. I had Trump supporter, you know, I had small business owners who were Trump supporters, small business owners who did not like Donald Trump. And I, again, I just wanted kind of that range 
uh, of experiences. And in fact, Donald Trump showed up in Old Fort. I had met TJ virtually, at least in early June. And in August, Donald Trump chose Old Fort, Pennsylvania as the place he was going to give a speech. It was on the night that Biden accepted the nomination. Joe Biden, of course, is from the area. He was born and raised until he was like 10 or 11 in Scranton. And I think this was his Trump's way of trying to distract attention, you know, from, from, from Biden. So anyway, I went there because in part because I'm a political animal and I thought it'd be funny. And there, Trump just drove right through my narrative. Well, I think you did a good job um, selecting the people that you highlight in your book, because as since I've read it, like they're very colorful characters. Um, like I know you didn't talk tonight about the furniture salesman, but yeah. every time when he would make his appearances, he, has, he was very opinionated. Um, you know, it was just really interesting. Do you um, do you have like a little favorite of like maybe one of the more like secondary characters that really isn't featured as much um, that kind of connects with you a little bit? Yeah, I mean, so. so. Might be Mark Muncy, uh, just for folks listening, he's diehard Trump fan, you know, in his furniture store, his, fa his father had created, bought the store in the 60s, he was now running it, he's in his late 60s, he and his mother was retired, but they own it uh, together, his father said, never put up anything, not even political, just like a favorite race car driver, because if someone doesn't like that race car driver, they're never coming back, and yet on his a uh, uh, filing cabinet, you know, the furniture store, there's a furniture, then you cut the deal, you know, at the desk. Um, and right there on, the, on, on next to his desk was Make America Great Again, you know, a hat. Um, and so, but I really enjoyed Mark. Uh, you know, outspoken, that's always good for a journalist. You know, you, you asked me in the question, the, your first question, was that anyone reluctant? I, I think he was reluctant. I'm, you know, I'm, from New York, you read my bio, I used to work in the New York Times, every assumption you can make about that is probably true. Um, and you know, so he kind of looked at me skeptically, but you know, I, I think people, even though they're busy, these small business owners, even though they're busy, they were going through something. And I find this as a journalist, when people, they want to share it. I mean, it's lonely, right? I mean, you're going through the struggle, you complain some, but like, you know, to your spouse, your friends, your kids, whatever, but, you know, you don't want to complain too much. And, you know, I kind of became a sounding board for Glenda from the, you know, the Hallmark store, you know, with Mark Muncy, we just have fun talking about it. I mean, we argue politics a little bit, um, but just kind of hearing his experience, you know, he dealt with, you know, kind of the, the supply chain, you know, suddenly it used to take two, three, four weeks, you know, at the top to, at, the, at most to get, a new shipment of chairs or appliances, whatever, you go three, four, five months, it's always two or three weeks away and wasn't getting it. So kind of sharing that experience, I, I kind of love all, I love them all. I actually felt bad that I had to reduce. In fact, one of my favorite characters, um, I don't mention at all uh, in the book. He was a pharmacist and I already had that story. Pharmacists didn't shut down. I mean, they weren't hurt economically. Uh, it was stressful, it was hard. But they weren't hurt economically, so that was, you know, that 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 that, that, that was that was hard. Um, had to write a very hard email. Thanks for your time, and I didn't even include you. Right, I can understand though. Going back a little bit, what you were saying about how people wanted to share the story, because I I feel like it was like a kind of an element, a therapeutic element to it for them to to make sure that their voices are heard. Like I remember not to get too like in the weeds, but like when our library closed, um, after the whole, you know, um non-essential businesses were told to close. The library, of course, had to close because we were considered non-essential. And a lot of us were just in the air. We had no idea what to do. And so we really did have a network of our colleagues to like really try and talk and figure out what was going on um, because no one really knew. Um, but small business owners don't really have necessarily that large of a network, right? You, you might just be you and one other person for your store. So I can understand why some people might really want to reach out and share their story. Right. So, um, you know, I want to talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about the dog we haven't really talked about in the room too much, and that's Amazon, as well as just big retail. Um, because you are very honest in your book that America has this a fascination about Main Street, that it's not even just a thing, that it's actually a part of our culture, um, and that it represents so much. But at the end of the day, small business in Main Street has been shrinking before COVID. Um, and with a lot of it having to do with the big box stores. 
Can you tell uh, from like a historical point of view when that really started to happen? Right. So, so you know, it's it's a little bit like the, uh, the was it a frog in the water that doesn't feel the temperature changing? Um, it, it, it's you know, big box stores became a bigger deal in the '70s and '80s. I mean, pharmacies, for instance, were you know there were big chains dating back earlier, you know, '40s, '50s, '60s. But you know, this idea of like the like Kmart, the the everything store where you could park in a lot and, you know, pick up clothes and hardware and, you know, with time, groceries and pharmaceuticals. You know, that was kind of more 80s, 90s. And then by the 2000s, they were everywhere. And of course, then you had the internet. Amazing stat, I think, for a pharmacy. So independent pharmacies are shrinking uh, as well. And some of that is chains, but there's an amazing stat. A lot of that is just online. So in the 1960s, more than half the money uh, a, a typical pharmacist would collect were from the everything else, toothpaste and deodorants, you know, makeup, that kind of that kind of stuff. Now it's less than ten percent. It's all, it's almost all uh, from pharmaceuticals, from drugs, and all. And so that's just been wiped away uh, by the internet. And so I, I think we're all kind of hypocrites, or most of us are hypocrites. I include myself on that. In that, oh, we love small business. I love that place. Wait, I could get the soap cheaper online. And so with each passing year, we talk about, you know, we pledge how much we love small business. But for some reason, Walmart gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Kmart's, you know, bottom line, Target's bottom line gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and all because they offer convenience. They offer uh, cheaper, cheaper prices. And so, you know, I, I think one silver lining of the pandemic is I think it made a lot of us more aware of the role small businesses have in our life. In fact, several of the small business operators I spoke to, they would hear at Glenda in, in Tucanic that, you know, I'm here buying more because I want to make sure you're here next year. So Glenda, this was true at her store. It was true at many stores. They had less people come in. I mean, some people, I don't want to go to a store. I don't have to go to retail. I can buy online. They had less of their regulars coming in, but the regulars who did come in bought more because they wanted Glenda, they wanted that store uh, a, a year from now. But with that said, you know, Amazon's profits, the first quarter of 2021 compared to the first quarter of 2020 were up 120%. You know, it's just like, it's, it's, I, my hope is that even though some share of our your shopping dollar, retail dollar goes to these giants that we reserve some of it, that we appreciate that that shop, even if, even if it's a little bit more money, it's a more, I ask people like, imagine the world without it. Imagine if our main streets were half boarded up and the rest were what cell phone stores or you know, whatever. Um, and there is no center no center of town. You know, it's like, who is supporting the Little League team? Who, who's, who are kind of the community leaders? A lot of community leaders, you know, come from small business uh, operators. So, you know, it's, it's I, I'm hoping, the optimist to me is hoping that COVID really underscored uh, the centrality of small businesses in our lives. Right. Absolutely. You know, another thing, though, that was discussed a lot during, especially the early days in the pandemic. And I was wondering if your book really investigated this at all, or at least I'm sure the people in the audience would like to know, is the, the kind of like unequalness and treatment for the big box store versus the small store during, especially the early phase of the pandemic. Um, what I mean by that is, um, I don't really have a main street in my town, but our Lowe's was still open. And I think everybody in my town went to Lowe's to the point where there's probably over easily over a thousand people in the Lowe's at one time, but the little like Sally's beauty supply next door had to be shuttered that at most might've had like four or five people in there from your research and who you've like interviewed, what was the reasoning exactly for the disparity a little bit of kind of, you know, shuttering the small business? It, it, in retrospect, it was a horrible decision. So Pennsylvania, apparently Ohio, many, many states did this. They said, we're shutting down all non-essential 
businesses, a garden store, a, you know, a, a beauty salon. Um, but because the big box stores might have a pharmacy, might have a hardware store, you know, it was almost they got through, they got to stay open through a loophole. And so what happened in area after area I visited, I heard the same story. This is like, wait, I, the furniture store, Mark Muncy, he's very outspoken about this. He has this huge 14,000 square foot store. He never has more than two or three customers at once. He could have people over in that corner. He could make appointments. He could have done anything to say, to, to make it say he wanted, you know, he's a guy in his sixties. He, he, he didn't want the virus, you know? And so I'll enforce masks. I'll do whatever I can, but he was closed down because he was non-essential. Well, meanwhile, Everyone's going to the Walmart and the same thing. He, he took pictures. He had pictures on, on you know, in, in the um, uh, storefront window uh, of like hundreds and hundreds of people at Walmart. So wait a second, we're shutting down a cent, you know, we're shutting down these small businesses to keep people safe. But that means we're sending all these people to a single locale, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, sharing the same air, <laughs> you're bumping each, into each other in the uh, in, in the aisles. The good news is in the fall when the governor of Pennsylvania did a second shutdown, he did not shut down uh, small uh, retailers. I, I think they at least learned uh, that lesson. But, you know, I, I mean, to me, the, the bigger point is that our system is rigged uh, in favor of the bigger players. I mentioned it with PPP, the very program created to help small business ended up helping 400 publicly traded uh, companies or all these rules, all these um, ways that, you know, I think the system is rigged in favor of the bigger uh, player. Um, and this was just yet another one. You know, while the small businesses are suffering, they don't have much in savings, you know, how are they going to survive COVID? You know, you, you had Walmart um, um, registering huge sales. Absolutely. And I'm sure part of that can, you know, be down to corporate lobbyists, things like that, putting pressure, you know, I'm sure Walmart has people that, you know, um, well, in, sure. in, in Pennsylvania, uh, that's exactly what happened. You know, it's just like, you know, you know, Mark Muncy, you know, Greenwood's furniture, he's not getting time. He tried. He's kind of a politically connected guy. You know, he tried to get, you know, time with local representatives, but, you know, he's just one small business operator, but, you know, the bigger players, they have a presence in Harrisburg, the capital. And I'm sure that played a, a, a huge role. And do you think maybe parts of this actually just boil down to uh, miscommunication over what a small business is? I was absolutely shocked when I read your book and that the Small Business Development Center, they believe that a small business is anything with under 500. Um, I, I've never worked with anything more than 500. And I've worked even like at a Target, like a real Target, and we didn't even have 500. And it felt like a massive operation. Um, why, what, do you know anything about this 500 threshold and why we use that for everything? So it's actually the Small Business Administration. Yeah. Uh, so in 1953, um, I, it, you know, it was Eisenhower's presidency. He, he, he signed it into law. I don't know why they came up with the definition of a small business up to, well, I do know why you said it yourself, you know, the power of all those businesses with hundreds and hundreds of employees, because if you're designated a small business through the SBA, you're eligible for subsidized loans, um, loans to start businesses, but loans to expand uh, your business. They did a poll in the 1950s, you know, right before the SBA was approved, and they asked people, what do you think of small businesses? Most said under 50, if not under 25, 3% said 100 or over. And yet it's codified into U.S. law. A small business is up to 500 people. And again, if you look at that, that's really, those are businesses bringing in tens of millions of dollars in revenue, but no, no reasonable standard. Is that a small business? That is not what we mean, most of us, when we talk about small business. I, you know, if I actually had one policy wish, I wish we could fix that. Because again, this is government dollars. I, I, I wish you well, company with 300 people. I, I grow to 1,000 people. But I don't really want taxpayer money helping that. On the other hand, you know, to kind of help Main Street to kind of make sure that there's new generations of small businesses, that there are these subsidized loans. That, that by subsidized, I mean uh, they're guaranteed by the government. So your local bank makes the loan, um, but the U.S. government guarantees them up to 80%. And so they're relatively risk-free. And so banks are making these commercial loans uh, all the time. But I really don't want 
my taxpayer dollar is guaranteeing a loan to some business that's already making millions of dollars in revenues a year. Yeah, I just think there's a, you know, a real big disconnect there because I've worked numerous jobs since I, I started working when I was 15. I've worked somewhere that had at most 13 people on staff. I said I've worked for a Target. I've worked in a library that had less than 30 people. And I've worked in a library with a lot more. And each one presents different challenges and needs. So to be able to say that, you know, for example, that restaurant that has five staff members is the same thing as like a corporation with multiple branches. It, it's not to me the same. Right, right, yeah, but, but it is. Uh, <laughs> According to the US government, it is. Now, without being a downer, but I would love to know your honest opinions about it because you have interviewed small businesses so much. You know, we're out of the pandemic and what I mean, we can go out and eat. We might not need to wear masks when we go out. However, there are still lingering effects um, from it. Everything from inflation, labor shortages, supply problems, et cetera. How do you feel that, for example, let's take the businesses you interviewed in your book, how will they need to continue to pivot to see around those challenges? Well, the labor one is really, really hard. I, I, we were talking before the event started that I really thought this would work itself out uh, mm -hmm. by now. So one of the main businesses in the book, um, Vilma's Hair Salon, Vilma Hernandez, an immigrant um, 20 or so years ago, started this hair salon. And, you know, now we're coming up on three years and she's still understaffed. She still can't find enough people to staff. She used to have eight full-time employees. And I don't know. I mean, I guess the good news here is that the big box stores are so desperate that instead of paying 12 or 13 an hour, they're paying 16, 18 dollars an hour. The Amazon's offering benefits. There, are, you know, others are offering Amazon too. You know, uh, helping you with college uh, courses. You know, will we'll help pay pay for that, which I, I think is a good thing. But it means the small businesses can't compete. Like a small business that's kind of living in Glenda, Glenda's JR's Hallmark. You know, she can't afford to compete and pay 16, 18 dollars an hour. It's not like she's making all this extra money. Already, she's competing with online, so she can't charge more for her products. People already are thinking she charges too much uh, for her products, and she's in a bind. Uh, you know, it's like she can't compete for people, and she's always understaffed. All these businesses across the country uh, are, are understaffed. I, I think the supply chain is writing itself. Um, I mean, not for every single business, but, you know, for instance, Mark Muncie at Greenwood's Furniture, it's much less a problem today uh, than it was uh, a, a, a year ago. But, you know, I mean, COVID lingers by coincidence. Um, it entered our household for the first time last week. Uh, my, my, my wife had it, so she's been over there and <laughs> we've been trying to avoid her in a, a apartment with one bathroom um, and our. But any, anyway, so, you know, it's like it's still here and we're heading to the winter. I, I don't I don't know, but I, I do think for small businesses, they've they've adjusted. You know, short of, you know, kind of something unforeseen, you know, I think the good news is for small businesses, you know, they've survived, they figured it out, they've learned the lessons, and short of governors making the mistakes of shutting them down while letting the big box stores uh, open, I think they'll kind of be back where they were in 2019. It's really hard to run a small business, but at least we're not dealing with a pandemic. Right. I guess my question is just like, if Walmart and Amazon are now offering potential benefits and higher wages per hour, and you just said like the small stores, like they can't compete. And I know like my first job wages, like, you know, I started my minimum wage was five fifteen an hour. So it, again, that was over a decade ago, but still, um, you know, how will these small businesses ever be able to catch up? Because like, it seems like the wages just keep going up and up. Well, I'll say a couple of things. One, small businesses always find a way. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's what Glenda would say is she orders, offers flexibility. I mean, you work you work at an Amazon fulfillment center, one, one of the main towns in the book, you know, has a giant Amazon fulfillment center. By the way, they are horrible uh, corporate, horrible neighbors. You know, like every other business was dealing with the, the mayor and the chambers of commerce and all that. But Amazon, they wouldn't even return a call. Like we're Amazon, we don't have to answer answer to you. 
Um, but you work at Amazon, they have very strict rules. You know, you, you can't be late, your kid's sick, you can't call in sick too many times without losing the job. And so there are some people who do want the flexibility, or at least they don't want to work for the corporate overlord and all. So I think there are people uh, who, who are always going to want to choose that, even if it's not quite as much uh, money. But no, Kelsey, it's, it's a huge problem. I, I don't, again, I, I'm shocked by this. I, I don't see uh, an easy solution. Small businesses today are still struggling. I mean, you mentioned there in Hudson, I saw it in the towns I was paying attention to, places that used to be open seven days a week. Uh, you know, a place that was, you know, had a huge Sunday brunch uh, um, uh, every, every uh, Sunday. They're no longer open on Sunday. They just don't have the staffing. They, they, they have to choose someplace and it's harder to get people on a Sunday and during the week. And so instead of open seven days a week, they're now open five days a week. They're leaving money on the table. It's harder to run their business and they don't know what else to do. Right. You know, without diverting too much, um, last night we did our annual pitch competition for Global Entrepreneurship Week. It's, it's like Shark Tank. So if you've seen the show Shark Tank, you know what we're going for. And of the seven finalists, actually only one has a physical footprint at this point, um, but it's a luxury good. And so I was wondering what your thoughts are about, like, maybe if it's going to be like the small businesses are going to cater more for the luxury end for those with the higher disposable incomes. Like when I was growing up, I grew up in a small town. We had the pharmacy. We had like the ma and pa, like it was nothing like a Kmart, but you know, you could get some overalls, you could get pants, you could get a bird cage, random weird stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but ever since the nineties in my town, my hometown, like all that stuff's gone. We don't even have a main street in my town. It's literally like the Taco Bell, Burger King, McDonald's row. Um, mm -hmm. That's my whole main street in my town. Um, so I'm wondering if your thoughts are, if, if, if entrepreneurs are going to have to continue pivoting and maybe for certain industries, you know, it's going to be more of a luxury thing for those people who can afford to continue paying the higher costs instead of like Amazon or Walmart's prices. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. I, you say luxury, which almost implies like very wealthy folks. I, I think it's more that, you know, Walmart has the really inexpensive stuff. So I'll carry the Woolrich. I'll carry kind of that, that next tier up. Mark Muncy, furniture store, you know, he loves when people go buy at Walmart, it falls apart in a year, and then they come to him because he sells a higher quality good. It's not the most expensive. He's kind of more in the middle. So I think a lot of people are going to figure out the price point where they're at that, yeah, sure, you could get it online, you go to Walmart, but we're offering something that you can't easily find um, uh, there. So kind of go more upscale, if not quite luxury, as you're using it. Right. I guess I was using the word luxury because this individual has identified the luxury market as mm -hmm. their particular market for their good without saying who they are. Um, but, you know, that was kind of a discussion amongst the judges even for that program, because, you know, since she was like the only physical one. And I mean, we received like almost a hundred applications for this mm -hmm. competition and very few anymore were having that physical imprint. I mean, the flip side to the luxury, the luxury strategy is like, there are a lot of people in this country, at least half, that you know they're you know a paycheck or two uh, a, a away from an economic calamity. So you know, a lot of people, you know, if you could reach folks with a, a, a an affordable product that differentiates yourself, but yeah, I, I I agree that the chocolate makers, you know, they went from physical stores to exclusively or almost exclusively online uh, for a while. The good news for them is they're now able to do. Uh, both. But yeah, I, I, I do think that's with each passing year, more and more uh, of commerce will be online. Well, I'm going to stay positive like you are, that things were going to turn around. It might not be overnight, but I'm hoping that the grit and the creativity and the dedication right. of our small business owners um, will allow them to continue to build and thrive through the different challenges that they're facing. Now, mm -hmm. Gary, before we end tonight, I was hoping, um, first of all, if you don't mind, uh, for anybody following tonight who would like to continue following you and your research, um, how do people follow you? And are you going to be working on any new projects? Uh, I'm on Twitter, at least for the moment. Uh, no comment. Um, I have a web page, just my name, www.garyrivlin. Uh, you know, I, I this people in Ohio can relate. I, I thought my next project was going to be about the spread of sports betting. In 2018, it was legal in one state, Nevada. 
um, now four years later because of a Supreme Court ruling, uh, is legal in 36, I think. Uh, I think Ohio is about to uh, roll it out. Um, but I'm, publishing's changed. It's, it's, I'm not, you know, for a kind of a work of journalism, let's, let's go explore this without having kind of a hot take. Um, I haven't found a taker yet. Let's put it that way. Uh, so I think that might be my next project, but I'm not sure. Well, there's always a market and a need for investigative journalism. As I'm sure you know, I always love to explore the stories of the people that I would not hear about otherwise, just like how your Saving Main Street book, you know, really opened up the voices for the smaller working people, the people that are okay just having a restaurant. They don't need to be the next big wig on Silicon Valley or anything like that. So I just want to say thank you so much, Gary, for this um, time this evening. I think your book is fantastic. For anyone in the audience, feel free to pick up a copy at the Learn It Out. We do have a link in the chat. And thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.